I'm going to tell you more than about the whisk. And the reason I will tell you more than about the whisk is that there wasn't enough in the whisk to take up the hour. <laughs> but I will start out by giving you a little st story about how I got into the computing field. When I went to the University of Wisconsin, I went there as a theoretical physics major. In fact, most interested in the uh, structure of the nucleus. And in the fall of 1949, I was given an assignment along with two other graduate students to determine whether or not a proposed force between nuclear particles could describe the simplest three-body nucleus. For 30 days, the three of us used a desk calculator with 10 digits and a slide rule to hold two more. And we mapped the energy state of the simplest three-body system, uh, tritium, for all values of the parameters and ascertained that the lowest energy level was still not quite bound. And I decided there had to be a better way. So I began to uh, invent something to do this computing. The first thing I did was come up with a design for a machine I called an electronic digital differential analyzer. We never built that one, but it turned out that independent of my activities in that area, such a device called Madida had actually been designed essentially concurrently in California. That following summer, I went to the Aberdeen Proving Ground and uh, got a chance to see the ENIAC and a, a machine that was under construction called the EDVAC. And I went back to the university at the end of the summer with an idea for how one could make something very simple, or so I thought. And that machine was uh, the machine that ultimately got called the WISC, which stands for Wisconsin Integrally Synchronized Computer. The WISC was a machine that had a very simple instruction set, just 10 instructions. It was a three address instruction set, and it operated in floating point. As a matter of fact, it operated only in floating point. It had, uh, other than a branch and a stop instruction, it only had one other instruction that wasn't uh, floating point. And that was an instruction that allowed one to move a string of bits from, of arbitrary length, starting at an arbitrary place in one word and to a, a second arbitrary place in the result word. And so one could take the components of the floating point operand, such as the exponent or the fraction, or an address in an instruction and move it to a place where you could do arithmetic on it without the uh, having any kind of normalization take place in the floating point operations so that you could do the floating point arithmetic for address modification, for example. Now that worked very successfully. Actually, we had one redundant uh, instruction. The branch instruction was really a, the redundant one because we had, I had a compare instruction in it. Basically, we had add, subtract, multiply, divide, compare, uh, extract, branch, halt, 
input and output. Those were the 10 instructions. And the uh, coding was extremely simple, ex extremely straightforward. The compare instruction, for instance, would compare uh, one operand with a second and branch to the third address. And so one could have always set it up to compare a zero against a zero or anything against anything and end up with a branch. Uh, and so the branch was unnecessary. However, the proposal I made for that machine to the university was sufficiently interesting so that the university decided they wanted to do it. And so they got my major professor to change my thesis subject to making a record of the, the plan for the machine so that they could build it in the engineering department, not as a computing tool, but as a, an educational tool for training their electrical engineers in this new field called computers. This was 19, fall of 1950. And in uh, January 1951, I began my first work in the electrical engineering department, uh, both starting the project and uh, writing my thesis on the design of that machine. It was completed by June of that year and I received my PhD on that the following February. It turned out that there was no, no one at the university who had any background in computers at all. There was nothing in the library. There were, in the library, I take it back, there was one uh, item on computers, and that item was a, uh, a book uh, published at the time the Harvard Mark I computer was uh, dedicated. And this was a very fancy book full of photographs. Didn't have any of the circuits in it, so I didn't get to even see how that worked. But, but it turned out we had no uh, access to any classified information, and classified information uh, all information on computers at that time was classified. So the WISC was really a, an undertaking that was a totally separate thing from most of the rest of the computing world. It had some interesting new ideas in it. This is a block diagram from my thesis. The machine was rather simple. It was a, consisted of a main memory of a thousand words, 32 words per track, 32 tracks. Each word was 50 bits long, 40 bits of fraction, 8 bits of exponent, and 2 bits for the sign of the fraction and the exponent. The Arithmetic was all serial, and the term integrally synchronized came from the structure of the arithmetic unit, which was on the, also in recirculating registers in the drum. The word length in the main memory was 50 bits, with put into a 55-bit uh, storage position, so it gave about five bit times for electrical switching to uh, select your word and to switch between read and write. Then uh, the arithmetic section had the recirculating registers that were 44 bits long with carrying 40 bit fractions within it. And the uh, number of times that would circulate during 32 of the full word positions was 40 times, which meant there was just enough recirculations to perform 
uh, a fall, multiply, or divide, or the worst case shift in floating point, add or subtract. So it, everything was organized to take one complete rotation of the drum for each full floating point operation. Then, in addition, the uh, machine had overlap or pipelining. There were four things going on concurrently. One was reading the inst instruction uh, in with the uh, program counter while you were looking up the operands for instruction n minus one, while you're performing the arithmetic call for in n minus two, and while you were storing away the results of the operation in n minus three. And all of those went on concurrently. The, uh, if I show you here, the arithmetic section was a set of three uh, recirculating registers. Short memory was really uh, keeping the operands that were, had been looked up in the main memory. And the uh, input-output uh, was the first channels that occurred in a computer. The input-output uh, would operate a punch paper tape and load a, up to a track's worth of uh, input operands or program. And when the programmer would call for an input instruction, it would actually be reading, generally, the input data from the buffer track that it had been loaded in the meantime. So to that extent, the WISC was perhaps the first of its kind in terms of uh, floating point, in terms of uh, overlapped or pipeline operation, and in terms of channels. They were, however, very rudimentary forms of each of those. The machine was built by the university. In fact, I got to know some of the people in the computer industry at that time. I negotiated for the magnetic drum with a company called Engineering Research Associates. And the, one of the men with whom I negotiated was uh, Bill Norris, who founded CDC. So that was an interesting experience. The machine was actually completed along about 1954 and remained in operation at the university until uh, along about 1959 when the last uh, person who could uh, maintain the machine retired. And so the university decided that well, the machine would be useless to them, but it might be useful to him since he planned to do consulting. So they offered it to him. He took it. He knocked a hole in this basement wall and put the machine down there and used it for several years before he became too senile to consult. <laughs> uh, and I, my understanding is the computer worked effectively for him. Uh, however, after uh, he became too senile to use it, the machine just sat there. And his wife and son hated to see that uh, area of the house go unused. So they decided they would uh, make some use of that basement. So they decided to use it as a pistol range. 
and they set, set the targets on the console. <laughs> and so we have the bullet holes now in that console cabinet. I keep telling people that it was shot at because they were fearful of these intelligent machines. <laughs> but when the man died, his wish was that I be given the computer. So we knocked a hole in his basement wall again, <laughs> took it out, and moved it to California. And so now it sets in our uh, company. The computer, as I indicated, was uh, performed one operation per drum revolution. And as you might gather, drums don't turn too fast. They do about 60 revolutions a second. And so this thing performed 60 floating point operations a second. It, probably about the same as you get on a handheld calculator today. I don't think you could hold that machine, however. It weighs, I gather, somewhere near one ton. Let me show you a little bit of the structure. We had the, re this is re structure in the, for the arithmetic unit. Basically, uh, we used recirculating registers. And so we had a read head, uh, a read head here, an amplifier. Then we'd go through some kind of uh, activity and right back into the beginning of that track. The, uh, in general, the amount of uh, circuitry outside of the recirculating register was very small. One might have one or two stages of delay. And in the thesis, I was indicating that between the write head and the read head for this short memory part, there were 53 bits between the two in terms of the angular position subtended by those heads. When we go through an amplifier, which would take a fraction of a bit time, a bit time in this machine was 10 microseconds. And then one would go through uh, a delay, which would be on the order of uh, one more cycle time. So that one would, one more bit time, so that one would get, just get enough delays so that you could write back into main memory and have everything be in proper phase for reading it again. Same thing would be true in here where we had input or output. So everything was uh, essentially put back into proper timing by adjusting the additional one or two bits of delay that you would have out, outside the recirculating register loop. And so most of the storage on this machine was actually on a drum, both during arithmetic and during uh, the uh, all the other functions. Now, short memory, this particular one I had shown here, that short memory held uh, all of the, the pair of operands that one was bringing in for the next operation. It held the instruction to be done after that, which had been looked up in the memory. And it held the results of the preceding operation in order to store it into main memory. And so basically one had four uh, recirculating registers 
for the purpose of short memory and one each for input and output memory. So that's really all I can say about the uh, WISC. So let me move on. I joined IBM. It turned out that the branch manager at, of IBM at Wisconsin had heard about the WISC and had contacted uh, IBM in uh, Poughkeepsie and apparently uh, did quite a sales job. And I ended up finding then that I was then approached by IBM. And I ended up accepting a job with IBM in late 1951, although I did not actually uh, go to IBM until June of 52. But the uh, decision had been made earlier. At IBM, I initially didn't work on computers. I used the IBM 701 in such activities as uh, doing study of neural networks in a project called the Conceptor, in which we were investigating the likely, likelihood of being able to produce some kind of intelligence uh, by modeling uh, a proposed neural network structure that had been set forth in a monograph by a man from McGill University, um, Dr. Hebb. We worked on that for some time and finally concluded that there were several elements in that uh, proposal that were undoubtedly missing. One of them was being able to forget because our models would very quickly get saturated in one direction. We could make them a little more capable by introducing a thing called forgetting. And that helped. But we still weren't able to really produce anything that we considered to be true learning although uh, we did get some modestly interesting results. I also worked on character recognition, and we made some very successful uh, strides forward in that area, being able to read in the high 99% area uh, for all of the for three major type fonts that covered something like 80% of all those in use in the uh, country. So we were very pleased with that. Then IBM decided they had to uh, enrich the interesting workload at Endicott, and so they moved our character recognition project out of Poughkeepsie to Endicott, and none of the people went. So, and as you might guess, the approach we took died with it. And finally, I got my chance in 1953, after being there about a year, to do my first work on computer design in that company. And that was an assignment to do the 704. Initially, it was called the 701A, and the assignment was really to produce uh, a field modification that could upgrade the 701. And I set about doing uh, the things that I thought would be helpful. And we introduced indexing and floating point as the two principal uh, additions to the structure of the 701. Now that, that made a very profound change in that machine because all of a sudden all of the programming approaches uh, had to be altered to take any advantage of it. The indexing was a 
pretty generalized indexing. And the floating point, uh, of course, uh, didn't change really programming techniques, except it eliminated uh, a lot of subroutines you would have required otherwise. But you wanted to be able to exploit the floating point wherever possible. And in support of that in the programming area, John Backus developed his first compiler the, for Fortran to run on that 704. So in a sense, the age of uh, at least a scientific compiler and the 704 were twins. That machine performed as a consequence of those additions at us something about five or six times more effectively on most of the scientific problems than the 701 had. And this cost was almost the same as that of the 701. However, it was a lot more complex than the 701 had been. But the complexity showed up mostly in the form of additional diodes and additional uh, complications in the nice, clean orderliness that had been present in the uh, 701. 701 was a very straightforward uh, machine, I think, uh, for a very good purpose. It was. It had to uh, be breaking a lot of ground in reliable uh, function. And being blessed with electrostatic memory, it was pretty hard to be reliable and have an electrostatic memory. In fact, it couldn't be. But as far as the, main, the mainframe of the computer was concerned, it really was uh, a very reliable system. The machine had a 12 nanosecond, not nanos, microsecond. <laughs> I'm a totally different age. Uh, a 12 microsecond cycle time, which was the cycle time required to operate the electrostatic memory. The electrostatic memory required regeneration because it would slowly tend to lose the information stored in it since it was basically being stored on a leaky capacitor. Uh, and so you'd cycle through the various memory addresses whenever you weren't using the memory to bring operands in for arithmetic. In the 704, however, when we'd gone about three-fourths of the way through the program, uh, not three-fourths, about halfway through, we decided to put in this new thing called magnetic core memory. Uh, it had been proven successful, successfully in a whirlwind and was going to be used in this project that was going on concurrent with the 704 called SAGE. And so we uh, went to work on developing this uh, core memory of 4,000 words to be attached to the 704. And it was a project being done jointly with the, another machine program uh, currently going on in IBM called the 705, which was a commercial computer. And so that memory was designed uh, and used on a 704. So we were able to come out with a machine that, in fact, was really very reliable. And as a consequence, it was a big seller in the industry. And some 140 704s were sold. Now, at that time, at that, time that was a major uh, success. It was when we first were uh, trying to make a forecast, the forecasting people 
uh, came to me and they were trying to get my acceptance and sign off on a forecast of six. The 701 had had 18 and they had a request in for 19th and I told them that I was sure that this would be wanted by every one of those people who had a 701 and probably uh, there might be more. And, well, they went back to think about that a while and they came back and they came, tried me with 12. <laughs> Again, I went through my same pitch. Then they came back with 18 and I said, we have this order to make the 19th 701. I'm sure they'll want it even more of this machine. So they came back with 32, and I bought. <laughs> and I was very pleased with getting a forecast of 32, and I was amazed when we ended up selling 140. After the 704, I went on to, well, I'd done along during the time of the 704 I'd collected a lot of things that I thought would be very good to have in the machine but it was too late to put them in and we ended up doing a 709 afterwards I wasn't on that project but I'd supplied the list of the things to put on the 709 and that really made a remarkable difference. It had, uh, for the first time, channels, uh, whereas in the 704, all input and output had to be programmed uh, a, a character at a time. And that was a fairly uh, costly thing in terms of programming time. Uh, time for executing programs. It w took quite a bit of the machine time. Well, the 709 was also a fairly successful machine, but it was supplanted very quickly by technology uh, of the second generation. The second generation really was started first in IBM by a project called Stretch, which brought transistors into their uh, major products. The Stretch w was the last thing I worked on before I left IBM in December of 1955. I had, done, had been given the assignment at the time we'd completed the 704 of preparing for the next generation of scientific computers. And at that time, uh, there was a procurement, or shortly after I started there, there was a procurement that was begun at Livermore Laboratories in Livermore, California, to acquire a very high-speed computer called the, which they called the LARC, Livermore Automatic Research Calculator. And I went to Livermore to propose this machine uh, to Livermore, and we lost out to, uh, I think it was Sperry Univac. And we ended up going back and working harder on what we had. And ended, ended up developing the first, well, what we call look ahead, in which we had the machine broken into two parts, uh, a, an address computer indexing and program fetch portion which would range ahead of the arithmetic unit uh, picking up instructions generating the addresses uh, and picking up the operands 
and buffering them until we could feed them into the arithmetic unit. Since, generally speaking, the arithmetic took a fair length of time, and uh, so you had to wait through lengthy instructions to get the input ready. And so you, you gain quite a bit of speed by having that look ahead. And so we were able to put together uh, a pretty good arithmetic unit to go behind that look ahead. The look ahead one had been there in time for the uh, proposal to Livermore, but it had not, we had not had a good enough uh, arithmetic unit behind it. We improved on the arithmetic unit during the course of 55, and Los Alamos became very interested. And they ended up negotiating a, a contract with IBM to develop it. But I left IBM in December of 55, uh, and I went out to the West Coast and for a period of five years was not really involved in uh, anything in the mainframe area. I got involved in the first of, of the uh, cathode ray tube terminals. And I ended up doing some things in uh, the small computer area, but nothing in the mainframe area. In 1960, I rejoined IBM as director of experimental machines and worked there on what was intended to be the next big scientific computer uh, to come out of IBM. At that time, the stretch was just being shipped, and there, the performance of the stretch uh, that was actually, uh, the stretch machine that was actually built was uh, not up to the expectations. And so uh, the price was reduced. And since the price was reduced, the profit had gone out. And IBM couldn't legally produce any more stretches than those that they had committed to do. And so they ended up making only seven of them. But uh, the stretch was nonetheless in its day a very uh, capable machine in many respects. Uh, lots, lots of function had been added to it after I left. And the additions uh, essentially made the machine a little too complex. And so the machine cycle time had gotten a, a little long. And some of the mechanisms were a little too complicated to be easy to manage for uh, very short, irregular kinds of operations. And basically, that was the nature of its uh, weakness. But following the stretch, uh, IBM was beginning to see a series of problems arising in its various product lines, because it had, IBM had essentially four or five different families of computers. And they were seeking for some way to solve their problems. And the decision was made that IBM should really unify its product line into a single combination scientific commercial computer <coughs> And this was the, uh, called the, ultimately, the uh, System 360. Well, I was given the assignment of doing the architecture. Initially, what I handled was the architecture, all the initial uh, engineering activities for laying out the data flows for the various members of the product line 
and for the initial programming. And I kept all of those responsibilities until we finally reached the point where uh, the data flows had been satisfactorily, at least the first look, uh, structured for each of the different perf members of the line. Now that was an unusual program in as much as we were simultaneously trying to develop uh, a whole set of computers that were to be related in performance and cost. They were to be about a factor of three apart in performance and roughly a factor of two apart in cost. They were all to have identical instruction sets, all to be able to connect to the interchangeably to the different pieces of peripheral equipment. And this was quite an undertaking in its day. As a matter of fact, there, were, there was a lot of skepticism within IBM as to whether or not uh, this could be done economically. In fact, it worked out extremely well. It was a big undertaking even for a company like IBM, and IBM choked on it a bit. But on the whole, uh, everything came out, I thought, remarkably well. The machines covered a range of performance of approximately 600 to 1, from the smallest to the largest. And uh, the Model 20 was at the low end, the Model 95 at the high end. I'm going to uh, show you on the next chart the Model 95. Actually, this started out as something called the Model 92. Uh, the Model 92 was structured to use a 3 eighths microsecond memory. And it ended up being shipped as a Model 91 with a 3 quarter microsecond memory and as a Model 95 with a 1 eighth microsecond memory. The whole thing was designed around um, the memory access time that would be associated with a 3 eighths microsecond memory. And uh, when you put the 1 eighth on it, it didn't go any faster than it well, it went about 15% faster than it would go with 3 eighths. You put the 3 quarter microsecond memory on it and it slowed down by probably 30 or 40 percent. But at the time, the, uh, we'd gotten a new <coughs> president for the uh, data processing division, and he had not been associated with uh, high performance computers, but only with small ones. And when he heard of that one eighth microsecond memory, he just insisted it go on there and was very confident that he'd improved the performance by a factor of three. He did improve the cost by about that amount. <laughs> and so the model 90, 195 had also problems with being profitable. But I consider this structure to be still, in terms of any machines that have been built, the most advanced one architecturally. And let me uh, go into some of these characteristics. First of all, it was recognized in this structure that the uh, biggest problem with being able to have concurrency in a machine was that it was such a long time from the time you first got an instruction until you could finally store the results away and have them available for use by a succeeding or somewhere following instruction. 
And so the name of this game here was to see if it wasn't possible to effectively make registers appear to function pretty much as memory. And so uh, if we look at the structure, we have an instruction buffer which got loaded by the program counter. It ranged ahead. Uh, we could load up to 16 words. Uh, uh, bigger pardon, eight words, 16 instructions approximately. And we observed at any time we came to a branch, we looked to see if, if the branch address was somewhere in that set of instructions. If so, we could loop within the instruction buffer. And that happened uh, quite successfully. If, when we ran into a branch, we also fetched the alternate path. So we'd be prepared in case the uh, branch didn't go the way we expected to uh, be able to go down the alternate path quickly. In executing those in instructions, we would first step we would do is essentially uh, generate the addresses. And then we would send out our fetches to memory and bring back operands into these buffers and put the instructions that were waiting then the use of those operands into these instruction registers. Then this, these, of course, were the internal registers for the machine. Now we had a similar thing over here, the buffer for the operands and the uh, buffer for the instructions. And then we had the floating point registers. If you look at this, this now really is a structure in which our program and our data are in registers. And that was basically the simple schema behind all of this. We also had arithmetic units which were independent and which, in which we could perform operations out of sequence so that we could be having two floating point adds and a multiply, let's say, going on concurrently. Our floating point adds took three cycles to complete. Our fl floating multiply took uh, about four cycles to complete. And quite often, we could uh, have these things going for quite some extended periods of time uh, in terms of multiple units actually running. Now, there were some other things that were done here for performance. And let me move on to the next one. Here, if we thought of the execution of these instructions in which we have the machine registers, you would bring in, let's say, uh, I better start in this with A. You bring in a, an oper. You have a series of instructions to execute. You want to load register R1 from address A, multiply what you now have brought into R1 by the operand and address B. You want to add a pair of register together. And then you want to store register R1 into the uh, third memory location. And then you want to load register R1 from uh, a fourth memory location. If you look at R1 setting here, then you would bring in the address, uh, bring in the operand from location A. You would uh, uh, send the results out of R1 to the multiplier, along with the contents of R2. Perform the multiply 
put it back into R1, then uh, you could add the, send the contents of R1 to the adder along with the contents of R2, put it back into R1, and then when you're done with that, you can store it into location Charlie, and then you can load the location D into register one. Now you'd have to go in that order if this, if things all went through R1. But in fact, in the Model 91, they didn't. The way we set it up, uh, we could bring the operands to one of the arithmetic units, let's say to the, to the multiplier as it called for, and the results of the multiplier went out in something called a common data bus. And any unit calling for that result as an input could then, say, bring it into that unit directly from the common data bus instead of having to have it go to the register and then uh, back to the adder. And similarly, it could go directly from the last of those units directly to be stored into memory. And it could come in initially uh, into uh, one of the arithmetic units without ever going into one of these registers. So what, what happens then in actual fact is that the contents of location A can go directly to the multiplier the results, the product can go directly as an input to the adder, along with the contents of register R2. And when that sum is completed, instead of being stored into register R1, it can go directly to location C in memory. And any time during this process, you could have loaded register R1 directly from location D. In fact, this could have happened here any time after location A had gone to the multiplier. D could have been fetched out of memory, but it couldn't have gone into R1 unless this one was able to go into the multiplier. But by being able to do things out of order, uh, the machine was able to keep those units very, very busy. In fact, I had an opportunity when we were making a proposal to one uh, laboratory. I had the opportunity on the airplane to uh, try to find the shortest execution time for some kernel that we were supposed to uh, get an execution time on. And I worked for four hours flying from New York to Denver, uh, trying to get the best sequence for the uh, Fortran coding, or any kind of coding of that uh, uh, kernel. And no matter how I went, I couldn't seem to get the thing down to more than a anything smaller than about uh, 59 seconds for the inner loop. And finally I decided, well, I'm not going to uh, work on that anymore, but I'd, I'd like to see what it just happens if I took this kernel and pretended I was a, a Fortran compiler and took the simplest possible compilation job of starting with the innermost parentheses and just working out. And I found that took 61 seconds instead of 59. And I was amazed. I, I was so desperately trying to get a low number so we could win 
And here the machine was doing almost as good a job as was possible to be done. Amdahl yeah, Corporation, we undertook the first large-scale integrated circuitry in uh, high-speed logic. We did ECL, 100-gate, uh, it was gate array uh, logic. We had it working within approximately 11 months of the time we founded the company. The uh, machine we shipped in that technology first was the 470 V6, and we it was called the 470, as in contrast to the IBM 370, because we believed, in fact, we had the first fourth generation technology in the world. And I still think it was the first, and it wasn't until, I think, 82, 1982, that CDC, CDC shipped a machine with uh, ECL, large-scale integrated circuitry in it. So we had the field to ourselves for uh, approximately uh, seven years. Uh, the last machine I worked on in Amdahl was the design of the 5860, which is now being shipped by Amdahl Corporation. It's a machine that is about uh, a little over three times the speed of the first 470 we made, about uh, twice the speed of the 470 V8, which was the last one of the 470 series. And it runs uh, currently at about 12 million instructions per second with uh, one uh, change, I believe they can make it up to about 14. In 1979, I retired from Amdahl, and actually I was suffering from a severe back problem, and did not have any intentions of starting another company, but in the course of trying to keep my mind off my pain without taking drugs, I decided I would try to get my mind totally consumed by uh, trying to solve the problems in the, that had, I'd last been facing in the computer field to try to get uh, more advances made there. And a, that turned out to be eminently successful in both ways. Uh, it really did keep me from uh, becoming victimized by my back problem. I got over that very successfully. And also uh, came out with such a, a series of exciting <laughs> ideas in the uh, computer area. I was working with my son and I have to be very uh, uh, open in admitting that he contributed at least as much as I did to those, to those solutions. We actually think enough alike so it was easy to work together. You could bat ideas back and forth more quickly than you could do with almost anybody else. And so we, could, we were able to come up with an idea Actually, it's a complex set of ideas that all have to relate together, which we were convinced would make it possible to do ultra-large-scale integration, uh, larger than what is normally being considered for VLSI. And we are currently in the process of developing that technology within our company and it looks even more exciting today than it did at that time. In this, we are able, uh, by all of our simulation studies, to build a machine that we believe is more than twice as fast 
as the fastest it can be built by any other technology that we know of that we expect to be uh, available at the time our machine comes out, which is be about two years.